Our speaker today is Christy Southern. Most of you know Christy. <laughs> Christy's a longtime member of our church, of course, and uh, um, as you read in the newsletter, uh, she was communications director for uh, five years until she retired in 22. Uh, Christy also served as executive director of Susan B. Komen Tulsa for over 10 years. And during that time, she was appointed to by two governors, a Democrat and a Republican. That's boy, that's I'm weird. Bipartisan. They finally came together huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, to chair the Oklahoma Breast and Cervical Cancer Prevention and Treatment Advisory Committee. And her parents, Carol and Daryl, uh, were longtime members of this class. Actually, they were part of the founding members, Probably. I think, of the mm -hmm. class. And uh, so, um, and they used to have the Christmas. Uh, breakfast over at their house every year. It was great. It's a lot of fun. And today she's going to talk to us about Israel in the time of Jesus. In the time so. of Jesus. Yeah. Thank you, you Bill. I appreciate it. Um, I did not get dressed in the dark. These shoes are intentional. I, uh, <laughs> I had foot surgery five weeks ago and um, finally in tennis shoes. It's the only one that fits. And uh, so I can drive, and um, it was this or the boot, but then I have to change out to drive. And anyway, so uh, I thank Bill Mildred for switching with me a couple of weeks ago because it would have been hard still to be up, and I still wasn't driving. So um, appreciate him switching lessons with me. Um, I'm really happy to be here. You all are, are long time, as I've said to you before when I've been here. We've done life together. We've done joys and sorrows and, and all kinds of celebrations and just everyday life together. So you all are very special to me, and I'll quit talking because I'll get emotional, but um, meaningful to our family, so thank you. Um, I have not been to Israel. Let me just put that out up front. <laughs> How this whole lesson came to be is I'm in a teaching rotation with the disciples, and Barbara Gilmore called and said, um, hey, when, you know, what are good months for you to teach? And I said, well, May is good. And she said, oh, aren't you going to Israel And I, with the church? And I said, no, but you know what? Why don't we do a virtual tour? Of Israel so we don't have to pack our bags and sit on the plane a long time and hike up and down and all of that so that's how this lesson came to be and it's uh, my resource is this book the rock the road and the rabbi that Kathy Lee Gifford um, wrote about her trips to Israel and each chapter is a place in Israel that she has visited she met Rabbi Sobel who is a Messianic Jew meaning that he believes that Jesus has come he is the Messiah and will return again as opposed to the more common Jewish belief that Jesus will come at some point and um, so he wrote um, different perspectives in her chapters from a Hebrew perspective. So that's what I'm going to touch on is more about the Hebrew aspect of the Bible and understanding it. My dad always told me growing up, he said, you don't, don't just read the Bible, you got to study it. If you really want to understand what's going on in the Bible, you got to understand the culture, you've got to understand the background, and you really need to understand where, you know, the translations and things like that. So I'm really appreciative that he taught me that because certainly as I have been going in my own journey um, as a Christian that um, that has come in very handy. Bible study fellowship was a tremendous help to me with that and I spent eight years in that studying just learning how to study the Bible and how to really dig in and, and make a difference in my um, faith journey. So um, I'm using this. We I don't know if you all were in class when we did this. I've done it. We did it in the Genesis class one time. They turned it into a study and we did it there one time and I've done it with a Bible study and I found it really interesting and some aha moments. Um, I'm curious who here has been to Israel? I know Mike we were talking about it. Who else has been to Israel? Okay, okay, good. So anything I say, just, I'll say it with confidence and you'll have no idea <laughs> if it's true or not. That's, isn't that what life is? You just confidently put it out there. So, um, but seriously, if there is, Meredith, did you go on the trip with the church? You went differently, okay. But if, oh, <laughs> okay, I'm not touching that one. So, <laughs> so if there is um, anything you want to add or whatever, please, please feel free to. If you ask me too many questions, I'll probably just say, I don't know. Um, I'll look it up, though, and get back to you. Um, but anyway, I think this is um, just, I'm going to try to touch on, we're, today we're going to be in Bethlehem. 
And when um, I did the study for the disciples, I actually talked more about the land, but it's, we're eight days away from celebrating the birth of Jesus. I have to focus on his birth. And so I'm going to really dig into some of the things that scripture says and try to give us some background that I hope will enhance maybe our time this week as we kind of go into our final preparation of celebrating the birth and what that means to us. Um, so this is the land that um, God gave and promised to, Israel, to Abraham and his descendants. Um, it's this little tiny, I had to put an arrow there because you can hardly see it, which is amazing to me when you look at the nations around it. And um, it is just this little tiny, dry, rocky piece of land. I was telling Mike, I always think of Israel as this, you know, like sand, and flat and dry and no trees and all of that. Um, of course, over the thousands of years, it, it certainly changes, but it is not. It's a very rocky place, apparently. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's about the size of the state of New Hampshire. Tiny, tiny state we have here. And it's been quarreled over for thousands of years because it is on a land bridge that um, connects uh, Asia and Africa. And so it was very important for trade. And what would happen is if somebody from the Middle East wanted to conquer North Africa, they had to go through this land or vice versa. They, um, their armies would have to go through it. So um, Israel at the time of Jesus was under Roman rule. We know that about 60 years before he was born, um, the Romans had come in, taken the land, and by the time Jesus was born, they had established a system of government. And so what they did is they would have Roman overseers over the land, but they had local people that would actually run um, everything day in and day out on behalf of Rome, not on behalf of Israel, but on behalf of Rome. So um, they named, during the time of Jesus, they named Herod the Great. We all recognize that name from various things throughout scripture. And um, his family was very prominent, so they named him king over Israel. He was Jewish, his family was Jewish by religion and trade and tradition, but they were an Edomite and they were despised by the Jews because he was very tyrannical. In fact, one of his sons, Archelaus, was so evil that the Romans even pulled him out of power. Um, that's how bad he was, and the, the Romans were brutal. So um, they were not a family that was well liked, probably, I'd hate to say respected, but they were obviously their position. They had to obey them. Um, so from the beginning, um, the Bible talks about the Holy Land, right? We know, and, and um, almost from the very beginning, because we, we know that's where the Garden of Eden is. We know that this is where God made the covenant with Abraham. We know that this is where from Egypt, <clears throat> excuse me, that Moses was leading the, the sla them out of slavery into the Holy Land. And it's where Jesus spent the majority of his life. That's where he lived, he was born there, he taught there, he died there and he rose there. So it's a very important land from that perspective. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how we learn about the land. Obviously I haven't been there, I can rely on books, but the most important book we can rely on is the Bible. That's the source of all of our knowledge. But there's challenges with that. Um, the Old Testament was written in ancient Hebrew, and the New Testament was written in ancient Greek because they were written, obviously, many, many hundreds of years or thousands of years apart. And um, so you have language barriers. You have translation barriers. So it's never typically a word-for-word -word translation. Um, and most importantly, though, is understanding that it was written by Middle Easterners for Middle Easterners, and we're Western. We have a different mindset, we have a different culture. Um, the one of the things I think about, um, you know, we all grieve in our own way, but one of the things you see in the Middle East is that they'll rip their clothes and they'll wail and they'll carry on, and that's not typically what we do in the Western culture. So it's hard to understand sometimes. We read it thinking it's literal, and it's really not, it's been translated. So how do we bridge that chasm to really understanding what the Bible is saying? And that's what I wanna to do today is with Rabbi Sobel's help is look at things from a Hebrew perspective and understanding some of these words. 
Um, I want to start first with scripture that you're going to know and could probably repeat with me um, to set the, the scene for what we're going to be doing in Bethlehem and why we're going to Bethlehem. And I like the New Living Translation because um, it's a little easier for me to understand sometimes. Um, King James I have problems with from a female perspective, and, um, but I think it's just one of the more easy to read languages that seems a little more true to the NRSV or NIV version. So that's, you're going to hear words that may sound a little unfamiliar. Um, from Luke 2, at that time the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her to be born, for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. So scripture tells us that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And the name Bethlehem means house of bread. And I love that too because what was one of the titles Jesus called himself? I'm the bread of life. Yeah, I'm the bread of life. So um, what I hope that you leave here today is recognizing the depth of meaning behind scripture that we're reading, behind these events that are occurring, behind these places that, that Jesus went to and um, what people experienced with him there because it is so much deeper and it can really grow maybe some of our understanding and closeness to God as a result. Um, it was a small town, fewer than um, probably a thousand people. This is um, you can see, they're, well, it's hard to see in there, but they're doing an archeological dig, so you're starting to get a picture of what it might have looked like in the time of Jesus. So again, it wasn't flat and dusty, it was rocky and dusty probably, but it was hilly and rocky, and um, you can see how a lot of the homes and stuff are built into the, into the um, hillside. There's also, it's hard to see, but there's also like caves everywhere, all throughout the, the, the rocks and everything. Um, it's probably a hundred people or so at that time. So if you can imagine why there was no room in the inn, as we typically say, there's you know less than a thousand people, and all these people are coming in from everywhere to do the census. So I'm sure it was hard to find find places. Um, and also, I don't have it written down, but the, there's a Greek word for inn, which actually just means like a room. It's like a, a guest place. So I get it's kind of I thought of it like a youth hostel. Everybody just brings their backpack and lays down and you sleep there. So um, it wasn't like there was a Motel 6 or anything that they could pop into and stay or make a reservation. Um, they just literally, everybody is just showing up there and they're trying to find a place for her to, to rest. Um, in the Old Testament, Bethlehem was known, so when you read it, it's known as Ephrath and that means fruitful. And we know that it's the burial place of Rachel. We know it's where um, Ruth and Boaz lived, and we know Ruth is in part of Jesus' genealogy. But more importantly, Bethlehem was the birthplace of King David. And Micah, the prophet, made a prophecy that Jesus would, the Messiah would come from the birthplace of David. So Bethlehem has a very important place in all of this um, story that we have. So we know as descendants of David, Mary and Joseph are traveling to um, Nazareth and they're gonna be part of the Roman census. And it's about 80 miles from um, Jerusalem to, or from Nazareth to Jerusalem. So um, I have not been pregnant. I don't know what it's like to carry a child, especially in that last trimester, but I can only imagine how challenging that was to be pregnant, no matter her age, <laughs> but to be pregnant, to be on a donkey on this rocky ground, up and down mountains and hills, trying to get to Jerusalem. Um, it takes anywhere about four to seven days to get there by foot or donkey. Imagine sleeping on those rocks. Imagine even safety concerns, because they're, you know, the caves and are, are they going to be safe getting there? And um, so obviously this was not an easy trip for them to make, but they were obedient to God and obedient to the government rule that said you have to come be part of the census, so off they go. So we know that they're, they've made their way to Bethlehem, and let me go back to scripture. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby guarding their flocks of sheep. 
Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you'll recognize him by this sign. You'll find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others. I can't even imagine that in this night sky. The armies of heaven praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. And when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and they found Mary and Joseph and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and she thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. So Luke says they were given a sign. Well, the word sign comes from the Greek words semion, if I'm saying that right, which means an unusual occurrence that transcends the common or natural events that we experience in life. They're given by God to guide and to um, mark sacred time and sacred events. And sometimes they're called the finger mark or the fingerprint of God, and it just displays his grace and his power. So what's so significant about where, where Jesus was born, besides the prophecy and that God ordained that, but where he was born and where, that he was wrapped snugly in claws and that these shepherds were out there, they were the first ones that God spoke to about this birth. So um, Rabbi Sobel is going to take us a little deeper um, into what Jewish tradition and ritual would tell you um, is about these people. So these were probably no ordinary shepherds. We know that the 12 tribes, 11 were given land and one was not. And we know, do we know what their job was, the Levites? Their job is to be the priests. Yeah, they're to be the priests. So they did not have land. So they served God by serving in the temple, keeping the, the flames going to show his eternal presence. And um, their job was to atone for the people. You know, they had a very important role. In addition, they did the sacrifices in the temple, but you have to have animals to sacrifice, and they have to be without blemish and defect, and so they were shepherds. They were Levitical shepherds, who that was their job, was to raise these animals, and when it was time for them to give birth, they would take them to, um, oh, I'm going the wrong way, wrong button, <laughs> there we go. Um, they would take them to one of these caves, and there were caves designated for these births of these animals. They were kept ritually pure, and the, they would bring their flock right here to one of these. And um, they would um, wrap them in swaddling cloth because these baby lambs were clumsy. And you can see jagged areas and ways that they could hurt themselves. And so if they were going to be used as sacrifice in the temple, they had to be swaddled and kept pure. And so we know then that, we, that Jesus was swaddled. The version I read said wrapped snugly in claws, uh, strips of claws. And um, we know Mary and Joseph could not find a place to stay. So is it possible they went to one of these caves? Now, a house could have been backed up to the cave, potentially, but um, this would be potentially where, where he was born. And, you know, we tend to picture him being born in a stable, and um, the manger is this, you know, cross, and it's got slats and hay in it and everything. Well, at the time um, of Jesus, there really weren't a lot of trees. There was not, everything was stone, so they were not able to probably build structures for their animals out of wood, because it would have been the cedars of Lebanon that would have been cut down built as a raft, and then floated down the Via Maris. So I can only imagine how expensive that would have been and precious that, that resource was. So they um, typically um, used these caves or built stone structures outside their home to house their animals. It was in the 1200s, this was interesting, it was in the 1200s in Western Europe that they began to set up nativity scenes or crushes. And that was at that time, they thought of stables as huts. So that's where the whole wood thing came from. It wasn't, um, Jesus was probably not born that way. 
And the whole, let me caveat all of this. This isn't, you know, this isn't life or death to as, as a Christian, whether or not he was born in a cave or born in wood. Um, but it's just interesting looking at it from a Hebrew perspective and their tradition of what they, they know and see. The manger was likely um, a trough, a feeding trough. And again, would have been carved out of stone. And there, a lot of the archaeological digs, this is from a dig that they found that the stone trough was there. And so um, interesting to think about. He was probably, there was, would have been hay, but was probably in, in that trough. Um, a key aspect of swaddling is salting. And um, for you medical professionals, you probably know some of this. When a, when a Jewish baby was born, the father would, or um, somebody would take that baby and wash him in salt water. And likely that's what Joseph did to kill the bacteria, any bacteria that could be there. But it's a common um, thing in Middle Eastern days, and, and even still today, there's an expression called, there is salt between us. And that is a, an expression used among friends, used, used among people who you have a very deep and reverent um, and treasured relationship with. And salt is mentioned predominantly through the Bible. There's, Jesus is the salt of the earth. And, um, you know, so there's so much symbolism um, that mixed in with all of this. And it also signifies our relationship with, with God. We have salt between us with God, and it's so deep. And Leviticus and Ezekiel also talk about salt. Everything coming in from the New into the New Testament is coming from the Old Testament because we're right at the beginning of this new covenant. And these people are kind of not sure, you know, we know that's why Jesus, there was so much turmoil around his ministry because he was upending the apple cart and, and saying, no, I'm the new covenant. We no longer have to do those sacrifices. I'm going to do it for you. And um, so it was very unusual. So there's still a lot of symbolism coming into the birth of Jesus. And Leviticus tells us that God set out a requirement as part of the religious sacrifice where he said, in every offering of your grain offering, you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. It's got to come from in here, our offering to God, our, our spirit, our um, just our lives. They need to come from deep within because it's part of a treasured and revered relationship we have with him. So um, one other, and this is total speculation on the part of Rabbi Sobel, but I love this, which is the cloth. It doesn't say he was wrapped in a blanket or a snuggie or a onesie or whatever. He was wrapped in strips of cloth. So there would be these strips. So Rabbi Sobel mentions this, and I just think it's kind of interesting to think about. Um, we know one of the oldest symbols of the Jewish faith is the menorah, right? We've seen a lot of that over the last week as they were um, recognizing and celebrating Hanukkah. It's a seven-armed um, candelabrum, and it's lit in the temple by the Levitical priest. So you have a priest and you have a high priest, right? We have two, yeah, two levels. Okay look into my, my expert here. <laughs> um, and so the priest's job was to, they, they would light the menorah at night, and in the morning they would clean out the wick and put a new wick in, and so it could be lit again. And so where did these wicks come from? Well, we know from the Old Testament that God had very, very specific instructions for the priest's tunics. I mean, even to the point, and I don't know if the people added this or God did, but when they would go into the holy place in the temple, nobody could go in there and other than the priest. And so literally they had bells on the bottom of his robe and in him, the women were not priests at that time, and they would wrap a string or something, a rope around his foot so if he died while he was in there, they could pull him out. You couldn't, you because you couldn't go in. You couldn't go in. So, I mean, it's very, like, what threads you're to use. If you go back and, and read that really interesting, um, I think it's Leviticus that talks about all these details of how everything is to be made, which is hard to, to take in all the time, but um, very, very specific. So these priest tunics were very, very special and important. And um, when they became so stained that you couldn't wash the stains out or they just weren't appropriate to wear anymore in service to God, they would tear those, ro um, those robes up, those tunics up, and use them for the wicks 
of the menorah. So they still served God. They still had a holy um, place about them and a holy service about them. So we know that Eliz uh, Mary went to see her cousin Elizabeth when Elizabeth was six months old. We know that John leapt at the sound of Mary's voice when he came in and, she, and Elizabeth recognized that Mary is the, going to carry the son and give birth to the son of God. And who was, who was Elizabeth's husband? Zechariah, he was a priest. Could she have given the tunic? his tunic to Mary, to Mary to wrap the baby in. Don't know. It's not, um, there's no, that's just a, a, a speculation that Rabbi Sobel had, and I just think that's really sweet to think that that's what Jesus could have been swaddled in. So we know that he was born in Bethlehem due to the prophecy and the obedience of, of Mary and Joseph to God. First of all, Joseph to continue on a relationship with Mary, to agree to be the father and the mother of the Son of God. They went to Bethlehem. He was swaddled, he was lying in a manger, and um, he, because he's the light of the world, he is the Passover lamb, and um, he is uh, the bread of life for us. I think it's interesting um, to note, let me find my notes here, um, the Bible doesn't say he was born in a stable. Let me go back and read that scripture. It just says he's born in Bethlehem, it says, yes, the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you'll recognize him by this sign. You'll find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. And to make sure, I went through seeing every single translation I could find in Bible.com, and never does it say he was born in a stable. That's something we've added. It does say there was no accommodation for them, but it doesn't say he was born in a stable. Yeah. Right. But are you going to... No, no, uh -uh. go right ahead. Oh, but December, I think, came later. I, I can't it's how you look at the... She goes into that in the book. It's how you look at the feasts, where the feasts were, and, and when the stars would have risen, and, and from an astronaut... Uh, yeah, astronomy, I guess. Or astro well, probably astronomy. Yeah. Um, if you look at it from that perspective. Later, One of those words. The yes, yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to get right into that. Yeah, no, no, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> no, please, this is, please be interactive. Please be interactive. That's great. Um, so that's, that's where I just wanted to kind of dig into the scripture a little further, studying the scripture, looking at it a little differently. And um, let's do, let's talk about the Magi now. And I'm going to jump to Matthew, where the Magi are mentioned. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king? We saw a star as it rose, and we've come to worship him. Well, King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and said, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so I can go and worship him too, wink, wink. And after this interview, that was added commentary there. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they'd seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Um, and we know why that is, because he was so paranoid he did not want this baby taking over his kingship, so he was having all these young children murdered as a result. So that's the wink wink. Uh, I want to go worship him. And so we know the Magi or these wise men were astronomers or astrologers from the east. They were not Jewish. They were not obviously Christian because we are just now, this is the birth of the Christian faith. Um, they had their own religion. 
Um, and we don't know how many of them came to worship because of the number of gifts, despite the song title. The number of gifts, we think, is why um, there were three, probably, could have been more. But let's just talk briefly about the meaning of the gifts as well. And gold was the Old Testament symbol for kings. So again, this is why you know people are expecting this powerful ruler to come in and get rid of the Romans out of there, give them their land back, and be this powerful ruler. And we know he wasn't. He was born humbly. And um, for all of us, not just for those who were in power or had the wealth to do that. But by bringing him gold, they were proclaiming him king, king of kings, which again is unusual if you think about their um, traditions and their religious background. The second gift they brought was frankincense. And so I mentioned the priest, and you have the high priest, and there are all these different festivals and feasts, but one that's so important and sacred to the Jewish faith is the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, as we know it today. And the Day of Atonement is when the high priest would go into the holy place, burn incense, and atone for the sins of all the people. So by them bringing frankincense to Jesus, they're acknowledging him as the high priest. And if you've ever heard of King or, um, Melchizedek, Dick, I'm not going to say that right, um, he was the only one mentioned in the Bible in Genesis who was actually a king and a priest. Otherwise, they were always separate, kind of like today, church, separation of church and state. You had your priests and you had your, your um, government leaders. But by them bringing him those two gifts, they're acknowledging that he is one and the same. He is king, and he is our high priest for people. And the last gift they brought was myrrh, and that was kind of a solemn gift because it's an embalming oil. So they were recognizing him as a mortal who's going to, to lose his life, but he's also going to do it as the high priest and king on behalf of all his people, on behalf of all of us still to this day. So they really, they were very thoughtful and significant in the gifts um, that they brought. So um, we go back now to Nazareth, and I mentioned, um, if you noticed, I said he, they found the house where Mary and Joseph were. Well, we know they didn't immediately go back to Nazareth after the birth of the baby. So they, they could have likely been there several years um, because we know that Herod ordered the murder of every male child under the age of two. So it's likely they'd been there a year or two. So you think everybody clears out after the census, goes home, and now they can find a place to live. So they are there um, in Nazareth. And this is probably what it could have looked like in that time. It was very small. It was a peasant village. It was not well looked upon um, by the Jews. It was, um, they lived very simplistic lives. Maybe about 300 people lived there in the time of Jesus. They were farmers and tradesmen. And it had, like I said, a negative reputation among the Jews. It was generally looked down upon, and particularly the region of Galilee, and particularly Nazareth was looked down upon. And if you remember in um, New Testament scripture, when people are saying, um, oh, what good comes from Nazareth? Can't be anything good. He's a carpenter's son. What, you know, what good is Nazareth? So I think that kind of tells the story of how well it was thought of. Um, this is... Um, a house that they uncovered, I think it was under a convent, and they were doing an archaeological dig. So this is symbolic of what Jesus' house may have looked like. So again, stone, no wood necessarily. They might have had some wood here and there to prop up things or, or whatever, but it was typically this. We don't know what Jesus was doing from the time um, he was born. We know the family went to Egypt, as God told them to. They eventually returned to Nazareth. We know he went to the temple when he was 12 because they were coming home from the Passover, and Mary said, I thought you had him. Joseph said, I thought you had him, and they have to turn around and go back. Don't make me pull this truck over, this wagon over. Um, so they have to, to go back, and they have to find Jesus, and he's in the temple, and he says, where else would I be? I had to be in my father's house, and asking all the, the questions that were amazing, apparently. But there is a, um, there is a document, a, a book called the Mishnah, and you have the Torah, which was the oral law, and then you have the Mishnah, which was written down. The oral law was written down. And so there's a passage from there that's just kind of interesting that may actually give us an idea of what Jesus could have been doing from the time he was born 
between that time till 12, between 12 to 30 when he started his ministry. It says, at five years of age, one is ready for the study of the scripture. At 10 years of age, one is fit for the study of the Mishnah, the written law. At the age of 13, for Bar Mitzvah. And at the age of 15, for the study of Talmud. And that is the religious law and theology for the Jews. At the age of 18, for marriage. At the age of 20, for pursuing a vocation. And at the age of 30, for entering into one's full vigor. Jesus started his ministry at 30. So this probably you know, gives us some idea of what was going on at the time of Jesus and what it may have been going on in his life. Um, we also know from the New Testament I mentioned, John the Baptist is born and he is out preparing the way for Jesus to come. And he is now baptizing people in the River Jordan. And um, this is where jo uh, Jesus goes to be baptized by his cousin. And uh, Mike was telling me that there's parts of it that are very clear, but the further north or south you go, it gets darker like this where the masses of people are um, baptized. I just thought this was interesting. It's all those sins floating. There, there, oh, there you go. The, okay, I like that. I'm going to remember that. <laughs> um, so we know after Jesus was baptized, he goes into the desert. Now, this is not what I pictured the desert. I pictured, again, flat dry, sandy, wind, you know, stuff blowing everywhere. But this is um, the Judean desert, and he was tempted there by Satan for 40 days. You can see it's very bleak. It's very um, difficult terrain. There's nowhere really to hide out of the sun and nowhere to get water and all of that. So um, not a place that any of us would probably choose to go, but that's where Jesus chose because he wanted to prepare himself, strengthen himself for the ministry. Um, and we know in hindsight how difficult his ministry was. So you can see why he knew enough to go and prepare himself for this. And the, the final thing that I want to close with about all of this time is that Jesus was a carpenter, right? We know that he worked with Joseph. Um, I quote a scripture that says that he's a carpenter's son. What, you know, what good can, can come from Nazareth? He's just a carpenter. And here we go again with translation differences. Carpenter actually means, from the Greek word, tecton. And we know tecton is a craftsman or a builder. And they typically worked with stone. So, because again, that's all there was there. This was not a, a wealthy community. They could not afford to buy wood and um, have all of that at their disposal to work with. He may have worked with some wood, but typically he worked with stone with his father. And once again, stone, we know, is so important. In fact, I was looking at the picture. That's my parents and Ed and Susie standing out there, that, um, the rock that we have in front. And it says, on this rock, I will build my church. So we know that stone has a lot of importance um, to Scripture and to God. And I want to read, um, close by reading this, because I think it's a good message for us to take into our lives, even in this day and age. And it's from 1 Peter. And it says, you're coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people. We know that from the prophecy from Psalms 118, where it says, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It's the cornerstone of our faith. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. We are. What's more, you are his holy priests. We are the holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, we get to offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, I'm placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will not be disgraced. Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him. But for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word. And so they meet the fate that was planned for them. Um, I think for me, the two most meaningful worship times that we ever have are the birth of Christ and Easter, his death and resurrection. Thousands of years later, when I, I, I always laugh and say, I'm like within minutes of waking up, I'm like, ah, oh, I've already sinned. God, I had a bad thought. I had a, you know, I was judging someone. I was whatever. And yet I have the assurance that I'm forgiven that if I take that to God with a repentant heart and a contrite heart, I have the opportunity to be cleansed, 
to start again and to be a light hopefully in this world, especially that's so dark right now. Can we go out and be that light? And can we um, recognize and honor God as our Passover lamb, as our savior and our Messiah? Again, whether he was born in a, a wood stable or a cave or um, whatever, that doesn't matter. But I think it does show the significance of the Old Testament, everything God has ordained from day one. I used to think that the Old Testament was the stories and then everybody mucked it up. So God started over again with Jesus in the New Testament. And it's not. Jesus was there from the very beginning. If you read the first three verses of Genesis 1, he's there from the beginning. And everything that was happening in the Old Testament was leading up the prophecies, even appearances of him pre-incarnate that scholars think occurred. Those were all Jesus coming for us and dying on that horrible cross and that horrible death so that we could be saved. We no longer have to go to a priest, to anyone else to atone on our behalf. We have the opportunity and the privilege to do it ourselves through him. Um, I once asked a minister, I said, why do we pray in the name of Jesus Christ? He said, he's your path. He's your high priest that allows you to go directly to God. And that's such a privilege. So I hope you have a beautiful and blessed Christmas with your family and your friends and that you will just maybe take into your heart a little deeper the significance of the birth of Jesus and what it means in each of our lives. Thank you for letting me be here with you today. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, Christy, we got time for a few questions. Any any questions while we got the expert up here? Now, you'll be yep. back again in January. Yeah, so hopefully in January, um, I'll be back, and we're going to talk about Jesus' ministry and talk about Capernaum and Galilee and everything that was going on there. So, um, yeah, thank you. Well, okay. Yes. Uh, when you said earlier on, Sobel, mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. They're, there's, yeah, they're, they're called Messianic Jews, meaning that they believe that Jesus was, was a great teacher and prophet, but he was the son of God, um, where most Jewish people believe that um, he is still to come. They believe that Jesus was a teacher and a prophet, but that he is still to come in the second, yeah. Um, so a Messianic Jew would be, would be us, except that they come from the Jewish tradition and they go to temple and follow the history and culture, he, learn Hebrew, those things that we don't do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Which doesn't specify a date and doesn't do that. When did he decide that December 25th would be his birthday? That I don't know, because I know she talks about a little bit in the book that it probably, it was either July or September. It was based upon the feasts and everything that happened, because again, we're, not, we're celebrating from a Gentile perspective, not a Hebrew perspective. So I'm not sure when that started. Well, I forget exactly what I learned, but it, it's something, you know, there used to be the midwinter solstice right. that maybe the pagans or whatever did, and somehow over it, this Jesus birth was decided. I don't know exactly, but yeah. pagans have something to do. <laughs> yeah, it's the way it, yeah, yeah kind of. should be we should be made happy <laughs> yeah that would I, think, be I think we can have a lesson on this we, uh, but, yeah, seriously. All the I, well I've done a whole lesson on Lent and it's very interesting to see the traditions where baptism came from and all of those types of things so yeah I'll, I'll have to look at that and see that's interesting to look that up yeah so great thank you